going live in three, two, one. Go. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Ganga Germany's Facebook Live series. Today we have with us Professor Shireen Musfi. You know, I have known her through her books and her work, of course. And when I was a student of history um, for my bachelor's, I read this book. Actually, before I um, took up history for my undergraduate studies, this is the book my parents presented to me um, many, many years ago. So this is called Akbar, um, Episodes in the Life of Akbar. And this was one book that really influenced me and I took up history for my undergraduate studies. Um, so I'm so honored and so glad. And nobody really needs an introduction if you know history and if you've studied history, you definitely know Professor Musfi's work. Um, but for those of you who would like to know, she's just done a lot of work in, um, in the statistical studies, taxation, trade, economy. Um, also, um, uh, this recent book, uh, Capitalism, Colonialism and Globalization Studies and Economic Change. So um, today, ma'am will be talking to us on Vrindavan, a pilgrimage town of Mughal India. So um, let's welcome Professor Muswi. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. How are you, ma'am? Perfectly all right. Just feeling a bit good problem today. Right, so let me begin as uh, um, yes, ma'am. already said that uh, she has asked me to speak on evolution of uh, a town, Vrindavan, in Mughal period. So I'll, I'll begin with how the town came into being and how it flourished. About nine kilometers north of the ancient city of Matra is Vrindavan, one of the holiest sites of Vaishnavite ocean in the interesting part of its story is that, that its entire history belongs to the Mughal time. The actual settlement beginning with setting up of a queen or group cottage and purchase of land in hamlets in, in the area under Ruth and his nephew D. Osman. It seems to begin, it began only in our first time, while the newly built temple themselves began to receive imperial Mughal land grant from an early time as 1565 to 9th year of Abbas reign. Hamlets like Besaid, Nagra, Nagu, and Nagon Gopa were absorbed in the new settlement, whose new name, Brindavan, Brindaban in popular Raj, used in Persian documents, is recognized in Abbas Parman of 1565 and 68. We thus have here a Vaishnavite holy place developing into a new temple dominated township, rising and, and prospering under the Mughal Empire. This is essentially this story, which is the which is the present. It is the theme of the present lecture. About nine kilometers north of uh, the ancient city of Matra is Rindavan, one of the holiest sites of Vaishnavite of King Chaitanya sect. The interesting part of the story is that, that its entire history belongs to Mughal times. It was during the first quarter of the 16th century that Chaitanya's pilgrimage of Matra began to drew the attention of the body of Vaishnavas to Vrindavan. Chaitanya's only stay in the region was rather short, but two of his disciples, Sanatan and Rupa, took residence permanently here and seemed to have largely contributed to its emergence as a pilgrim center for the devotees of Lord Krishna and Chaitanya. And Chaitanya. Just, at the, uh, just to give a feel of the time, I would like to give an incident, relate an incident of Chaitanya's visit to Matra. 
it is reported that Chaitanya heard a so, milkman or a guala singing and he got a key and it was Vijili Khan, a Pathan, who was coming at the head of his contingent and he thought that it was uh, that this saint has been uh, drugged for the purpose of uh, theft or plundering by these people who were around him, his own disciples, and got them all arrested. After coming back, coming out from the stream, Chaitanya himself has to explain that the whole situation and only then Vidli Khan released those people and accompanied. So this was a time when if a uh, saintly looking person is supposed to be in problem, the officials of the state will immediately take action without knowing who the person is. The place at the time of their advent, a little before mid 16th century, was a jungle, uninhabited. As uh, as a Persian document reports, there was no particular place designated in Bali. While Chaitanya's own stay was very short, and he left soon, it was his two disciples, Sanatan and Hoot, who stayed back and took a permanent residence there. It seems that it was this which contributed largely to the emergence of, uh, a, a emergence of this place as a pilgrim center for the devotees of Krishna and Krishna. Now, the squint in the, the, there is no, as I've said, there was no really uh, place which was called uh, Rinda one. It was only a group who has the first bought or first uh, acquired a queen at some place in the vicinity of village settlement beside, close to the bank of Yamuna. It was in 1558 that Jeev Goswami acquired land around this queen. The seal deed of 1558 in Praj does not name the place as Vrindavan. The sellers had earlier sold the land to the Thakur of village Sai, Ali Khan, who, however, didn't oppose or didn't resist and let Jeev Goswami buy again the same spread of the land. The name Vrindavan came to be assigned soon after to this place. The Persian version of the same deed authenticated by the Hazi described the sellers as Mukaddams of Moza, that is village, Vrindav. It is to be uh, kept in mind that all documents in the Mughal period, whether it is the sale of land or whether it is the grant of land or whatever it was, they were to be authenticated by the Mughal Hazi of the place. Agbar's Parman of 1565 assigns 200 gigahertz of land to give a gain in Moza Vrinda 1. So very early, that is by 1565, the Gosai started receiving the land grant from the emperor himself. The, that the first such mention in the official documents appears in this permanent. But Vrindavan does not seem to have had a separate revenue existence. Since Akbar's Parman of 1598 places Madan Mohan and Govinda Temple, Govindev Temple in village Gosai and Kulera. Quite obviously, Vrindavan was a new settlement which go largely within the boundaries of the village of Gosai, cut across the older village boundaries and caused a recognition of its separate existence 
without however eliminating or absorbing for a long time the older villages today the site of uh, three main villages namely dosai bhilera and rajpur where the major grounds of rinda one temple were made are situated within the limits of rinda the present day during the second half of the 16th century jeev gosain began to acquire various plots of land in 1568 he bought a piece of land as joining the 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 kund of root and the area around it from four joint cellars again through ali khan's support for rupees 16 in cash and interestingly enough rupees 10 in gowns the description of the boundaries suggests that the place was still more unoccupied because the acquired land did not adjoin even a cultivated land the amount paid for the land seems considerable and the fact that he was on it to the body indicates that even at such such an early time the offerings received were quite substantial for him to manage this matter the conditions of the time were indeed conducive for the growth of such pilgrim center in the vicinity of Agra's capital agra the mendicants and the temples received attention and grants from the emperor and his nobles in 1665 akbar gave a grant of 200 bighas half cultivated half waste as, as was generally the rule for the madade mahal grants or grants for um, religious purpose to gopal das in the village of rinda gopal das was the sevak of madan mohan temple this grant was made on report of raja bharmal kotwa in 1568 another farman was issued on the recommendation of kodarmal granting the protection of his, his adhikar of madan mohan and govind dev temples to be and giving him exclusive control the one received a fiscal advantage because besides offering certain amount of revenue as uh, some amount of offering certain um, amounts of village revenue also started flowing into into the temple in 1579 the deep goswami has uh, resources enough to buy six tracts of land in far away village ari for rupees 238 In 1584, Kodarmal himself made a grant of 100 bighas of cultivated land to Gopal Das, sevak of Madan Mohan Temple, out of his jar. It was again to be noted that this continued to be confirmed and reconfirmed by succeeding jagirdars after Kodarmal's jagirdars transfer from there. In 1590, Man Singh rebuilt the Gobind Dev Temple on a grand scale. It seems that during this period, Brinda Gunwan grew rapidly, as can be seen from a Parman of Akbar issued in 1598. That has the merit of listing all the temples of Mathura and its environs there, along with all the imperial land grants made to them. one finds that at least 17 out of the 35 temples listed there in this farman was situated in rinda while the land given in dosai village within the vicinity um, of rinda one alone was 469 bigha ilaha that is the current current major of land or major of area grants to these tem- these temples were also made from the adjoining villages 
मुलेरा राजपुर नागौर नागला गुसाई नगला नागौर an interesting feature of these grants made on the report on the report of abul fazli was that these were not made to individuals serving that particular seva of the temple after the seva death or transfer from there it had to be reissued but here since it is to the temple whomsoever be doing anything this is perpetual and the grant to function more land was acquired by the goswamis and other brahmins from the peasants of the area mainly through purchase we have evidence of 16 sale deeds between 1572 and 1600 in vrindavan and its vicinity one sale deed shows akbar's famous noble man singh buying land in 1594 in gosai for a garden for the his 20 the uh, maintaining 15 transactions shows Give Goswami Hari Das of Govindev Temple and Avanand of Gopinath Temple as buyers, while the sellers in most of the cases are cultivated, describing themselves as village pans in the past. One sale deed refers to a previous sale of a haveli or house by one Keshu to Gopin. In some deeds, an interesting phrase occurs. land the price is very very comfortable for the rupees for the king by the vrindavan had attracted a substantial population to no precise quantitative estimate can be made the boundaries of the plots given in the sale deeds of us and as the main evidence there are not now the kind of limits set by tenium and meribulum trees and the bank of jamna as previously mentioned but mud boundaries in backments of if a person spilled or a lane between two Uh, retreat or the public road is now mentioned to demarcate the bounds the place was thus acquiring the character of an urban settlement and among the witnesses we now find of halls that is dunyas and even sarra in many kingdoms the plots bought by the brahmans and other sevaks of temples are shown as as climbing the hills of chamar and cobblers and kumbhi the, the lowly professional class which is rather an interesting fact to be noted among the sellers and witnesses we have a sprinkling of muslims as well ali khan of sai appears quite important in the very first known land transaction in between the two The namesake of his much later keeps appearing as witness in a number of other deeds among the peasants selling the land. We come across Nizam or Nizam, Hamiu, Humayu, Junaid, and Nasu. One deed is written in the hand of Mumin. The deeds are regularly reported to have been made in the presence of Hindus and Muslims. An interesting fact, however, to be borne in mind here is that in this region or in this town, it was not the religion which was fixed, but it was the caste. Ah, uh, the Sai, the Ali Khan of Sai was son of Angad, and we similarly find a large number of Hindus who were then. converted to islam or got muslim names at least and the muslims who have the hindu names 
the only thing which is fixed is that they all have the core of our class. The extension, ex the extensive temple construction that is started during the second half of the 16th century and culminated in Man Singh's construction of Govind Dev Temple must have drawn a number of artisans, masons, and stone cutters to the place. The massive, elegant structure of Govind Dev in, is built in true Mughal style in red and stone. The stone cutting, the decoration, and the grand vaulting make it almost an extension of Fatehpur Sikhi buildings. It is not unlikely that some of these stone cutters came from there. The ground plane plan seems so similar to that of a church that it was speculated that the architect got the assistance of the Jesuit missionaries at the Mughal court. Not only on the plants of Akbar in 1608, but gave fresh plant in 1612 when the Sevaka Hapudwara, a temple heard of for the first time, received the grant, imperial grant of 10 BC. In 1613, he converted total merge grant, grant of, uh, to Gopal Das of 1584, uh, which was 100 Bidhas into an imperial grant, so made it permanent. He himself visited Vrinda I in 1614, something rather unique, which Akbar would have never done because he was, in a way, not um, ready for any sort of, uh, belie believing in any sort of incarnation from other, but certainly ready to not only tolerate, but even support him off. So he saw numerous temples built by Rajput Nobu during the reign of Akbar. In 1608, Man Singh made a grant of rupees nine daily to give Govind Dev Temple out of which rupees eight were for the temple and rupees one for the favor. Another noble made a grant of rupees 60 a year to Madan Mohan Temple from 1607, confirming the cash grant in 1621. Shah Jahan made no fresh grants to the temple, but continued all the previous ones. He only transferred the grant of Govind Dev Temple to Raja Jaisinga Pamir. It was probably to give him more effective control of the temple. The seven sale deeds relating to Shah Jahan's reign suggest that the Goswamis come continuously expanded their landed possessions. However, there now seems to have been a shortage of land available for buying. In one case, a piece of land, 19 square feet, was bought for the six. The description of boundaries. or land of a temple or a private lane or a public road. The price of land also appears to have driven quite sharply in the closing decades of the 16th century. The price quoted in the sale deed varied from two and a half to four rupees per week in 1654, but it and earlier in the, the rate quoted is rupees 13 in 1702 and over rupees 13 in later. The emergence of the temple township of Vindavan generating an increased demand for land for house, houses and gardens thus created a vibrant land market. The growth of the township did not apparently bring about any corresponding change in the administrative structure. 
we do not hear of any officers posted, especially at Vrindavan in the 17th century. The Mukaddams remained those of original villages, which constituted the area of the township. The Aji registered documents and executed, and the agents of the Jadir also are uh, the Kozdas, who carried on other administrative functions, resided at Matra, which was only nine kilometers away from Bunda. It seems therefore that such action as was taken by officials whereby those stations at Matra. Some such officials early in Kajahan's reign prohibited the sounding of Whatever is the specific reason that the beating of the gong was necessary for divine worship, for a special Elahim, making it clear that for him the worship in the temple is also the worship of the God or the divine worship. Though the grazing tax on the uh, temple cows was remitted from the time of Akbar, the local officials of Pardana Mahabhan started realizing it, and the Pujari of Govind Dev Temple was obliged to make a representation to Prince Varasi who held the area in charge. The prince, in January 1556, limited the Gosumari and also prohibited the officials from taking data or forced labor from the gardeners of the temples or garden and or the art. This suggests that Govindev temple had pastures and archers in Mahaban across the Jamuna as well. The temples continued to gain from princely crown. Rani Rambhavati, Vidya of Raja Kim, the son of Rana Amarkin, built a dome and a pillar in 1637 at the south side of the choir of Govindev temple, according to the inscriptions on the date. Aurangzeb too continued the grants, though no new land grants were made. In 1704, however, Mukhtar Khan, governor of Suba Agra, issued a parvana ordering each village of the Pargana Matra, Sahar, Mangota, one rupee annually on behalf of annually on each half, half at each harvest to Vrindavan as the to Biranan as the heir of Rudra Swami. This was done for the reason that the Goswamis used to feed all mendicants, Hindus and Muslims, who came hungry. The order was reiterated in 1710 again. During Aurangzeb's reign, the township faced two periods of considerable trouble. Around 1670, the temple priest of Vrindavan became apprehensive about their images due to the destruction of Kesha's life temple of Matra. The, the image of Govindev temple was taken to Kaman on the way to Amir by the priest Shivram in 1671. Ram Jivan Gosai left his Mubeli at Matra, which then fell into ruin. This was perhaps overreaction because we find Ram Jivan coming back to Vrindavan and getting his wedding details. He was still there, there in 1670, continuing to speak over the person. And so, nothing, no temple was touched by Aurangzeb in Vrindavan. The second period of disturbance was the period of the Jat uprising 
which is mentioned in our documents more than once. Kishin Charan, Charan the seventh in the line of Ruth Goswami, was obliged to leave Vrindavan and seek refuge in the Rajput country between 1689 and 1692, owing to dark circumstances. But these were temporary phases. Soon afterwards, in 1698, we find Gobind the Pujari of the Govind Temple, taking a village, Pujinar, in farm, on farm in Pargana Sahar for one year for rupees 65. One can get an idea of his wealth from this fact that in the same year he pledged to pay rupees 16,000 to Raja Bishan Singh on account of a large tax farm. The, the, this may suggest that the wealth of Pindavan remained safe during the two troubling periods. It is therefore not surprising that Chaitanya Devan went on and acquired much land houses in Masjid. Whatever trouble had been created around 1690, it did not prevent pilgrims regularly arriving at Vrindavan from Odisha and Bengal during the latter years of quarantine. Burjanan, the Gaudiya came in 1703 with offerings in cash and time along with so many followers that Shyamanan's garden became insufficient to house them and he took on hire a park or a garden belonging to the Amir house at Hiragha, Grindar, from Bodhi Charan. In 1706, Gopal Raman came from Bengal to take the position of his uncle, Braj Kumar, sixth in the line of the Goswami, as the Adhikari of Madani Mountain. The period of the latter Mughals until the end of the reign of Muhammad Shah saw many property disputes among Goswami and other members. The Mughal administration often advocated in these disputes. There is a Farman of Bahadur Shah of 1711 confirming the grant of Gobind Dev Temple made to Jaisin and a Farman of Muhammad Shah of 1723 granting one rupee from each village the mendicants to the three worldly wives increased these resources following to the downshift by investment in land and also perhaps in use. Much before 1588, these Goswami received an inheritance not only the property and books, but also the loan acknowledgement known as Samastu. He also left the loan papers to his successor, Glass Das, in 1606, and he in turn passed them on to Kishan Das in 1637. One may assume, though, there is no definite proof that the loan documents were either receipts of principal on which interest accrued or were bills obtained at this time. However, with the progressively increasing prosperity of Vrindavan, urban vices are whatever. There was theft of temple property. In, in 1652, Har Gobind Brahman committed theft in the Govind Dev temple and then committed suicide. His men were then expelled from the temple. In 1710, Gopi Raman, sixth in the Deep Goswami's plan, suspected Kunjidas of misappropriation of large amount of cash and goods belonging to the Madan Mohan temple. When Kunjidas was called to account, he tried to strike back by bringing another person, Gopinath from Bengal, to replace Gopiraman. But Gopiraman, by paying much money to officials or intermediaries, procured Sanas in his own favor and the attempts 
moving field. The township of Indrawan received cartographic depiction from the surveyors of Amir or Japur, the or Japan Fort in the 18th century. The most interesting is the bilingual map, apparently early in that century. It shows the township divided into many points or retreats, quietly named, one belonging even to Shyam Hatik, that is vegetable seller, seller, another to Sudhdev Sa, a broker, yet another in our Our documents are surprisingly silent about commercial activities at Rindu. The reason seems to be that, that perhaps because of the proximity of Madhya, its markets were quite small. The author of Hadithatul Akhalim, who visited Vendavan in 1730, says that though it had noble, notable buildings, there was only a small bazaar containing 20 or 15 shops of glasses, bakery, and uh, flower filler, and such other things. This brings us to the relationship of the township with Mata. It would seem that not only was Vinda one administratively a dependency of Mata, but commercially too, it was a satellite. The distance between the two is barely 10, 9 to 10 kilometers, and this probably in has inhibited the transformation of Rindavan from a pilgrimage site to a commercial center. Mathra could meet these needs, and as the divines of Vaishnava of Rindavan, Started developing from a small village to or a small area to a full fledged town as a pilgrim center during the Mughal period. And it was mainly the contribution of the Mughal emperors and nobles themselves which helped this town to emerge and to survive. Thank you. Jay. Ma'am, can you hear me? Hello? Ma'am, can you hear me? Yes. Let me transition. Yes. Shireen, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you hear me, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yes, I can hear you. Great. Thank you so very much. Ma'am, I just want to know um, what were the sources that you used for uh, for researching on this? Very good. Uh, I intended to say it right in the beginning. All the sources used are the documents in Persian mainly and in Dutch, which are the document documents dealing the disputes among the, because of course some are the Parmans from the Mughal emperors or the Parvanas of the nobles and others, but mainly these Parma, these documents are those which are for solving the disputes and therefore everyone has to go to the Qazi and have these things written in Persian mm -hmm. and get signed by them. If you have to buy a land, the deed will be signed by the Qazi. As I have said that, it is Qazi who calls it the Sorry, it's the Qazi who? Sorry, we lost your uh, voice there. Temples and from various 
from various sources, Jaipur and other places, by late Dr. Tara, by, by doctor, late Dr. Uh, Tarapad Mukherjee, hmm. who wanted to write on this, and he shared these with Professor Rupanjali, and I got access to these documents courtesy of Professor Rupanjali, and already wrote about it. Right. Professor Habib has already written now a full book uh, with, uh, in collaboration with Tara Tarapad Mukherjee. There were some chapters which were written during his lifetime. The others he completed, which has recently come out. Its nature is not, it's not only talking about Vrindavan, but it is a much wider scope which he covers in this. So, uh, yes. um, yes. Ma'am, actually, we often get asked this question by some people who have not studied for hist history formally. So they ask, what did the Mughals really, I mean, it's like opening a Pandora's box right now. But um, in a short, so they ask, what did the Mughals really do for the common people? Were there any public facilities that they provided? Did they make any attempts to make life of common people? Uh, better is a question that we are we are asked very often and uh, you know so they want to know why do we talk about Mughals in such a sense uh, Shibuta, I believe it's a very good question and but it's a uh, reply requires much longer a time yes uh, I believe I'll be talking again on some other uh, program G uh, we'll be dealing with the uh, Wealth and poverty in Mughal Empire. Right. Here I will be discussing. G. Okay. Okay. Ma'am, can you hear me? If you only look at what Mughal ways are paying full attention for uh, their uh, well being, for protecting their rights. Was it not for the common people? Because it was the hordes of people, as I mentioned, some even coming from Bengal and Odisha and other places, who were visiting that. Mm -hmm. And as you have already uh, heard me saying, that the, there was a whole amount given to these people. One rupee from each village means something like 3,200 uh, villages were there. Uh, rupees which at that time was a huge amount, not thinking of today. So simply for to the people for providing food to those who are visiting the time, who are coming and visiting. And here it is, it is because they are feeding all Hindus and Muslims together. Hmm, hmm. So there is, even if we take some smaller points over here, but we can go in a greater discussion on this issue and I think uh, we have enough information how, what they did yeah. is not directly, indirectly help the poor. Hmm. At the same time, we can also say that like all other rulers, they were also exploitative. They were hmm. collecting a high amount of land revenue and all those things. But it was not Revenues and whom they were in in 25th regnal year, which Abul which Fali describes in a banana, to ask people what he should do for the good of his subjects. And Abul Fali's own um, suggestion was that there should be free hospitals uh, open at different places for the public, and the, even the medicine should also be provided free of cost. Uh, um, it was Salim or Jahangir's advice that the, there should be a ban on the child marriage because that is against all that. So there was a, all the nobles came up with their suggestions hmm. how something can be done for the good of the public or for the good of the subjects. And Akbar, certainly we at least have the information how the hospital should started working in different places. At 
Lahore and Agra and Delhi, we certainly have the full information on which people have been talking about. Right. Okay. We should definitely have another discussion, a longer discussion on this topic. And um, thank you so much, Professor Musfi, for joining us. Um, it is such an honor, really. Um, Thanks for giving me a hearing. Thanks for that. Okay, so everyone on our end, um, uh, please stay tuned. Tomorrow at 5 p.m., we have Professor Daljeet Kaur who will be talking to us about exploring life of Nana through miniature paintings. So tomorrow at 5 o'clock um, on Ganga Jamani, we will have uh, Dr. Daljeet Kaur coming.